I am sitting here in beautiful Aurora, Colorado with U.S. Congressman Mike Kaufman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I grew up here when it was a very different community, when it was a small community. In 1964, when I was nine years old, I'm 63 now. Uh, my father was a career enlisted soldier, and so he came. There was a, used to be an army hospital here. He came here for his last assignment. Obviously, I was gone for my service in the Army, the Marine Corps. Uh, but outside of that, I've always been here. And this has always been my home wherever I've been. So in layman's terms, could you explain to us what the responsibilities of a U.S. congressperson are? Sure. It's really divided in two separate parts. I think the first part is sort of all around us today, and that is the constituent work of being uh, of, the, of the residents of the congressional district. And so this district uh, is incredibly diverse. So a lot of, a lot of casework and immigration issues, a lot of casework on veterans issues. So things that involve uh, an individual in terms of their ability to uh, get something approved through the government in, in some way. The other level is from a policy perspective. And so that's done out of Washington, D.C. You know, introducing legislation, amending legislation, obviously voting on things. So how do you balance the responsibilities between your Colorado constituents and your federal responsibilities? Well, they're really equally important. And so uh, when I am not scheduled to vote in Washington, D.C., I am here. <laughs> working out of the, my, what we call my district office here in Aurora, that is based in Aurora, literally in the center of this community. Okay. So you got into politics about 30 years ago. Could you tell us your primary drive? So uh, I was in the State House of Representatives for a little while, State Senate uh, in the legislature. Uh, then I was State Treasurer uh, for about seven years, minus the one year that I was in the Marine Corps, left office to, to be in the Marine Corps. Uh, for an assignment in Iraq, and then I was Secretary of State for two years. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about immigration and sure. border security and paths to citizenship? Um, as you spoke, your district is quite diverse, 20% sure. Hispanic population. Could you it's talk extremely, about it's extremely diverse, I think, no doubt. I mean, I, I think the United States uh, needs to have secure borders, not just the southern border, but secure borders. Very sympathetic to the young people who were brought here illegally as children who are under the DACA program. I've worked to try and protect them uh, in that program to, to extend it, but also to that they have a path to citizenship uh, based on affirmative behavior, based on work history, based on education, based on military service. But what I would like to see, uh, and I've talked about it, and I don't know if words are used against me, but I think we should transition to what I would call a zero tolerance immigration system, but my definition of zero tolerance is not the same as the administration. What I think we should happen is what we need is a window of opportunity. Let's just say it's for six months. The adults who knowingly broke the law, who haven't broken other laws, uh, who would have the ability, some of them have been here for decades, to come out of the shadows and have a legal status that would allow them to work and to live in the country without fear of deportation. Then let's move to a tougher system uh, with better enforcement. When the administration was tearing families apart at the border, uh, I literally went down to the border to see how the children were being taken care of. You've been a fairly vocal critic of the current presidential administration, sure. um, but you have voted pretty closely with it. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, I think that, you know what, that? I mean, that's pretty, it's a fairly goofy metric by a blog, the, the 96%. I am one of the most bipartisan members of Congress. I'm ranked number 12 out of 30, 435 by the Luger Institute. I'm a member of a, a bipartisan group called uh, Problem Solvers, and it is a group of Republicans and Democrats that have come together and drawn bridge the partisan divide in Washington, D.C. And our goal now is to force rule changes by standing up to our, whoever gets, whoever is the majority after this election, to stand up to them that we believe we have enough numbers to um, deny uh, whatever party has a majority from being able to seat a speaker until we have some rule changes. What rule changes would you Well, right now, there is the, the, problem, the fundamental problem with the House of Representatives is there's too much power in too few hands 
with too little getting done for the American people. And so I'll give you an example. We have a, a bill, a bipartisan bill with 327 co-sponsors on it. They can't get a vote, cannot get a vote because one person is opposed to it. So because one person is opposed to it, the bill goes nowhere. But we want to say, one of our reforms is to say, if a bill has 290 co-sponsors, it has to come to the floor for a vote. Nobody in leadership can block it. There's not been a reform in the House of Representatives in terms of how it operates since 1923. Wow. And so it is long past due uh, for a reform where we can work on the issues that are important to the American people because people are frustrated and they ought to be. That's, I'm frustrated. Most of the things that we want to vote on, we're not allowed to vote on. So, I mean, they're not choices. So the things that we want to bring up, that we make statements about, that we introduce legislation on, I mean, they don't come to a vote. That's the fundamental problem. And I believe that we have the ability with a small group, when we're making the commitments now, our bipartisan group that says, whoever is in the majority, those members of that party who are part of our bipartisan caucus will stand up and block the nominee from their party from becoming speaker until we get a commitment on these rules. Um, you are in support of a full repeal of the ACA. Could you talk about ways that you sure. see um, Coloradans getting the proper medical care they need? I think the way to do it is we all have to pay in to um, a pool or uh, use that term to, to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Once you've taken care of people with pre-existing conditions, once you also have a safety net for the uninsured and underinsured, then you can have freedom of choice uh, for everybody else. And that was my fundamental difference uh, with Obamacare, was requiring everybody to have the same policies. One of the big things that I support here, uh, nationally and in this district, are these uh, what we call federally qualified community health clinics. And we have a network in this district, as there are in many districts, that have low-income populations, underserved populations, that have ex extraordinary clinics uh, where they can come to, and it is on a sliding scale basis. I think access to healthcare is very important. I think affordable access to healthcare is very important. I think taking care of people, uh, uninsured, underinsured, uh, those with pre-existing conditions, it's very important. Thank you so much uh, for you. sitting with us today. It was Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much.